There is a place hidden beneath the depths of the multiverse where the spectacle of life rules uncontested over vast plains and blooming forests. And the corruption of death and the decay of time are but a tiny inevitability in an otherwise perfectly harmonious and idyllic world. This world is called Naya, and it is but one of five fractions of a bigger one. Alara was the name of the original plane, and the Sundering was the name given to the mysterious cataclysm that shattered it. The mana imbalance that followed the rupture caused the five shards of Alara to evolve in widely distinct directions over the course of thousands of years. After the millennia, only hints of a common ancestor plane remain on the five worlds, and their environments and denizens could hardly differ more. On the mainly green-aligned world of Naya, life, passion, a wider sense of community and untamed wilderness flourished uncontested due to the total absence of black and blue mana. In this lush land, the wonders of life were celebrated with genuine awe and great deference. Instinct and nature triumphed over machination and artifice. Naya's inhabitants spanned across different races, from humans to minotaurs, passing through elves and leonin. Regardless of their origin, they all revered nature and showed the deepest respect to the titanic predators that lumbered through the plains rain forests, the behemoths. The geography of this world is far from regular. Intimidating peaks tower over narrow canyons extending down to the depths of the earth. At the surface level, the jungle is the undisputed king. Fueled by heavy and intermittent rainfalls, the rampant vegetation is in a wild and constant race towards the little sunlight that penetrates the upper branches. And the canopy is carefully weaved together with the aid of massive lianas that can grow up to 5 feet in diameter. Animals, humans and elves use these lianas as highways to travel across the jungle without exposing themselves to the risks of the ground level. Indeed, amidst the buttress roots are massively sized termites, fungi and logger ants who can easily take down and consume the unaware passers-by. A constant, pale mist known as white cover looms over the jungle and is rarely pierced only by isolated ranges of steeply slanted mountains. On Naya, the jungle is unceasingly trying to outgrow itself, and whatever or whoever can get the highest has the best chance to survival. It is by far the most dangerous habitat on the plain, and it is occupied by humans. While many of them still live in makeshift dwellings carved out of tree trunks, an increasing number of humans is building stable villages clearing land for agriculture at the ground level. These sun seeders, as the other races call them, make use of trained behemoths known as plow beasts and wage a relentless war against the glorious jungle growth in their quest for open space. Going up a level, the nomadic tribe of the Cilian Elves controls the treetops. The Hells folks are evasive people, uninterested in getting entangled with other races' problems and keen to be left alone. They mainly dwell in the tree canopy, gathering around giant dewcaps forming inside the leaves of huge ferns and there they build oasis-like encampments of unspeakable beauty and refinement. Led by the elf shaman Mael the Anima, the Cilian elves worship the behemoths of their plane, believing that the beast's actions are prophetic signs foretelling the awakening of the progenitus, an enormous five-headed hydra who slumbers below the earth in the Valley of the Ancients. As of today, the elves are in the process of expanding their territories on Naya and have surpassed the Nakatl as the dominant race of the plane. Moreover, there is now more hostility between the two than ever before as the wild Nakatl are moving down from the mountains and back into the deep jungle. Leaving behind the mighty, health-teeming trees and proceeding further along the rocky backs of barren mountains, one would soon catch sight of the proud, leonine cloud Nakatl. In past time, the Nakatl were the most civilized and advanced race on Naya and the uncontested rulers of the plain. At the peak of its power, the Nakatl Empire of the Clouds benefited from an extensive and functional system of roads, bridges and aqueducts. With time, however, unrest among the population grew and an internal conflict eventually destroyed the empire. A revolutionary group known as the Claws of Marizi started a civil war that shattered the established order known as the Coil and brought the Nakatl civilization down to its knees. The Claws essentially rejected the civilization process undertaken by their race and fought to defy the set of laws that, they believed, subjugated their true and wild nature. 
As we have mentioned, the Claws ended up winning the Civil War and subsequently detached themselves from the Cloud Nakatla, forming a new pride called the Wild Nakatla. Then, they decided to move down from the mountains and return to the lowland jungles, where their ancestors once lived. Since that day, the Wild Nakatla have been celebrating the breaking of the coil in an annual holiday called the Festival of Marisi. And it is right here, between the encroaching jungle trees and the beasts that emerge from their shadow, that the story of Ajani Goldmain begins. Ajani was born an albino wild Nakatl around the year 4527 AR, in the Kazal Valley on the Shard of Naya. He was immediately stigmatized by his own people solely on the base of his appearance. For the wild Nakatl, white was the color of death, and this led the young Ajani to live his entire youth as an outcast. Not much is known about Ajani's family either. He never met his parents who left him as he was still a cub. The only family he has ever had was his older brother Jezal, who, contrarily to Ajani, had gained a great deal of respect and a position of relevance among his peers over time. One day, due to a power vacancy, Jezal was elected Ka of the Kazal Valley Pride. He proudly accepted this position in the hopes that this new title could bring some degree of acceptance and honor to his younger brother Ajani as well. Unfortunately, this was not the case. The albino Nakatl kept being looked down upon and was barely tolerated at court. He would spend countless days alone, reflecting upon the meaning of goodness and virtue and honing his magical skills. In fact, the bone-like white fur wasn't the only thing that would make Ajani unique among his tribe. He was also the only Nakatl able to manipulate the various streams of magic present in his soul and by far the best healer of the tribe. Likewise, he was also able to read other beings' soul by staring through the depth of their eyes and to see the very essence of their spirits. He could then call this essence forth and make it manifest in a variety of ways. A couple of years after the establishment of Josal as Ka of the Pride, in the weeks preceding the annual festival of Marisi, Ajani was mysteriously attacked by a squad of human mercenaries who had been sent to slaughter him. The white cat warrior fought courageously, but he couldn't possibly face a dozen warriors alone. As he was about to be overwhelmed by the group, Jezal, warned by his patrol guards, rushed to his brother's aid and saved his life, butchering the remaining assassins. To thank his brother, Ajani decided to hunt the largest and mightiest of Naya's wild beasts, a god sire. Secretly, he also hoped to gain the pride's approval through this epic deed. The Nakatl eventually managed to bring down such a monster, but the battle had also taken its toll on him. Before he could claim the kill for himself, his worst persecutor Tanak ambushed and savagely beat Ajani, taking advantage of the exhaustion that followed the fight. Then Tanak carved out the godsire's fangs and brought them back to the feast as a proof of his grandiose victory over the creature, essentially stealing Ajani's achievement. In the meantime, a sore and hurting Ajani dragged himself back to the festival, but once again, placing the interest of the pride before his own, the white feline decided to keep his peace and not raise any issue about what had happened. That same night, however, after the reveries had quieted down, a dark, hooded figure lingered over the sleeping pride. Chanting unspeakable words of darkness, they released a vessel of death magic into the still crackling fire and shades of despair burst forth to attack the heedless tribe. It was a bloodbath. The still asleep adult males were the first targets. Females and cubs came soon after. Amidst the confusion of battle, Ajani rushed to his brother's lair to ensure he was okay. As he approached the entrance of the cavern, Ajani heard a shrieking cry of pain hailing from inside. He desperately hurried to the doorway, but it was too late. As he entered the lair, Jezal was being struck to death by a dark, double-handed axe wielded by a shade who vanished immediately afterwards. Ajani dashed to his dying brother and, as he watched the life slowly abandon Jezal's body, he heard one last time his cow's voice. And when he opened his eyes again, he was no longer a Naya. A 
Ajani awoke on Junt, another one of Alara's shards, and soon met the dragon worshipper Turkirian planeswalker Sarkon Pole, who protected the Nakatl from the fury of Kartus, and listened to the neophyte walker recounting his anguishing tale. After Ajani had finished to tell his story, Sarkon took great pity on the Nayan planeswalker and took him under his wing. He explained to Ajani what he had become when his spark had ignited and showed him how to planeswalk to other planes. The Half Dragon Planeswalker also advised Ajani to exploit his newfound gift as Walker to track down his brother's murderer and exact his revenge. Grateful and moved by Sarkhan's kindness, the Albino warrior decided to heed the man's suggestions. He then took his leave and went back on Naya. He went back to Jazal's lair, but there was no sign of the body, only remnants of his brother's axe. Still sick at heart for his loss, Ajani decided to merge the head fragment of his brother's weapon to his own, creating a new cliver that would symbolize his quest for revenge. He then found Jazal's ashes in the proud mausoleum, spread them over his own body, and solemnly swore he had done anything to bring his brother's murderer to justice. His quest started with Tanak, the same Nakatl who had persecuted Ajani for years and had stolen his god Sarkil at the festival. Ajani soon found him as he was overlooking a cliff. What started as an argument quickly turned into a rabid fight. The white Nakatl was truly interested in pursuing his brother's killer, but this was also an occasion to finally set the score with the other feline. In the end, Ajani pushed his rival off the cliff, but Tanak managed to grab Ajani's garment and drag the planeswalker down with him. Taking severe injuries in the fall, Ajani had no other option than disappearing again through the timeless depths of the Blind Eternities. This time, he awoke on the Shard of Bunt, in the care of the White Heron Night Plains Walker, Elspeth Thyrell. He spent two weeks in the care of the best Bunt ball givers, and when he had fully recovered, Ajani decided to leave, warning Elspeth of disturbances in the other flow, which foresaw an upcoming conflict. Back on Naya, Ajani confronted Tanak's mother, who, shockingly, revealed to him that the legendary Marizi might have had something to do with the attack on the Pride. Although bewildered and reticent about this lead, Ajani decided to leave no stone unturned and headed towards the hero's manor. There, Ajani was welcomed cheerfully by Marizi, but as the Albino Nakatl presented to him the true reason for his visit, the two were interrupted by Mayael, the leader of the Elves on Naya. Marizi apologized to Ajani, but nonetheless dismissed him, pointing the planeswalker to seek a certain dragon called Nikol Bolas if he truly desired to have the answers he sought. Knowing of only a place where dragons dwelled, Ajani began a walk to the plain of Jund. For days, he inspected every corner of the Blind Eternities, including the most secret and obscure fragments of them, but the Shard of Jund was nowhere to be found. And that was absolutely normal, because Jund no longer existed. The conflicts had begun. Okay, let's rewind a second here. What is the conflicts and who is this Nicol Bolas dragon? As far as anyone knows, Nicol Bolas is the oldest planeswalker in the multiverse. Ages before remembered history, Nicol Bolas established empires across multiple planes, hoarded secrets and treasures beyond number, and wielded the power of a true god. When time rifts in the fabric of the multiverse threatened to destroy Dominaria, he helped to heal those rifts, but at a terrible cost. In the process that came to be known as the Mending of Dominaria, the power of every living and yet-to-be planeswalker was greatly diminished, robbing these godlike beings of their immortality and near omnipotence. Bolas felt his power drain and his millennial knowledge seep away like water through a sieve. He would never have that. And so, he conjured schemes and wove master plans inside of plans to chart a path that could lead him back to divinity, to the ancestral power he had lost and conceived as his birthright. The conflicts, instead, was an upcoming natural cosmological event that was supposed to bring the five shards of Alara back together into a single plane. In the process, an enormous amount of energy would be physically released and be up for grab. It was the perfect chance for Bolas. For his sick plan to work, however, the Elder Dragon needed not to be disturbed. So, he began traveling from one shard to the other, manipulating individuals and exploiting their ambition to foster an environment ripe with tension and on the verge of generalized conflict. Diffused war would have been the perfect distraction.
After a rough landing, Ajani found himself in the presence of the clan El Toth and on the mightiest of human warriors, Crash the Bloodbraided. The Nakatel explained his position and the tribesmen agreed to help him slay the dragon he was after. The group then embarked on a long journey which brought them to the borders of Grixis, the fourth of Alaris shards. There, Ajani met Mayael the Anima and the Nakatl tribe shaman Zaliki, who had been the only member of the Kazal Valley pride that Ajani could ever recognize as his friend. The two unexpectedly asked the Finland Planeswalker to lead an attack against a legion of dragons commanded by no less than Ajani's own friend Sarkin Bo. Torn between his friendship and that he owed to the man who had saved his life and taught him the basics of being a planeswalker and the obligation he felt towards Mael and Zaliki, Ajani couldn't possibly make up his mind on whose trust to betray. This internal struggle consumed the planeswalker from the inside and, if this wasn't enough, he soon after also discovered the truth about his brother's death. The Leonin Zaliki, only friend to Ajanis and the only member of the tribe that the planeswalker had ever trusted, turned out to be the true responsible of the attack, although he claimed he had not acted on his own initiative. Marizi himself had manipulated Zaliki into doing so under indication from Bolas and on the promise of immense powers and riches provided by the dragon at Jazal's death. However, as Marizi had already been slain by Zaliki, who later regretted his actions, Ajani's oath of vengeance was destined to remain unfulfilled. There was no time to settle things properly though, because amidst the confusion of the situation, a darker and more dreadful threat took shape. The eldest of dragons, the Deathbringer, the winged dark Nicol Bolas himself made his entrance and, in front of all the assembled armies of Naya and Jand, he consumed the great magical energy released by the conflux in the form of mana waves pulsating from a great maelstrom that aspired to life at the epicenter of the Five Shards' impact. In a desperate attempt to stop Bolas, Ajani drew fully on the magical power of his soul and telepathically severed everyone's mana bond. Then, he dashed towards what little remained of the Maelstrom's energy and managed to absorb it before Bolas could. Using that power, he channeled his magic and called forth an effigy of Bolas' soul to confront the Dragon Planeswalker with a worthy opponent. Energy coursed out of Bolas' chest like a stream of star-encrusted ether crashing into the depression left by the Maelstrom and splashing against the rim to curve in on itself. The stream warped and distorted as a form took shape. At first, it looked like a dragon made of surreal air distortion suffused with an ultraviolet glow. As it continued to cohere, detail after detail resolved like a distant image coming into focus until it was a glowing, astral reflection of Bolas himself. Suddenly, the dragons reared back, gazed with pure hatred into one another's eyes and then thrust their necks forward and snapped their jaws onto one another. The streaming energy of the Maelstrom enveloped the draconic Ouroboros and a flash of thunderous light overwhelmed the Jani's senses. Later, Ajani sat at the edge of the valley for a long time, waiting for Bolas to return and devour the rest of Alara. But he never did. In the aftermath of the conflict's wars, Ajani was offered to succeed his brother Jazal and hold the position of Ka of the Pride. Respect and recognition had been Ajani's reveries forever. He had dreamt of being accepted by his kin above all else in the world and for his entire life. But not anymore. He was not the same now, and he no longer wanted acceptance or recognition. Justice, instead, was what he was after. Not just for his own plane, but for the entire multiverse. So, after thwarting Bolas, Ajani was finally able to set aside his anger over his brother's death and travel the multiverse. He entrusted Zaliki with the responsibilities of being Ka, and, driven by a fierce sense of justice, he became an advisor to Leonin communities on many planes. He also took on the role of mentoring heroes, especially planeswalkers across different planes, teaching them how to hone their skills and the multitude of secrets of the vast multiverse. Sometime after the conflux, Golmain sought out Elspeth to pay off his debt towards a white planeswalker from Bund. 
Ajani eventually found the Heron Knight in the gladiator pits of Urborg, facing off another heavily armored planeswalker whom the Nakatel didn't know at the time. However, when Elspeth got the upper hand in a fight and was about to deliver the killing blow to her opponent, Ajani stopped her as he saw a weird and eerie symbol on the other walker's forearm. Golmain then escorted his friend to her residence and begged her to go back to Alara with him, maintaining that she could do infinitely more good on her own plane rather than stupidly fighting for money in the pits of that wretched place. To Ajani's astonishment, the White Knight firmly refused his offer, claiming that there was no honor in fighting for lost causes. Eventually, she said, the putrid stench and the rot of Grixis would overrun Bant's golden and glorious plains. There was no point, she cried, in opposing the inevitable. Upset and distraught by her rebuke, Ajani couldn't really do anything other than acquiesce Elspeth's refusal with sadness. Then, as a final gesture of kindness towards his friend before his departure, Ajani returned her golden armor, which had been left on Bunt, to its rightful owner. For a while then, Ajani continued on his mentoring quest across different planes in the multiverse. His peace, however, was troubled by a constant thought that would keep him up at night. He couldn't possibly accept not to do anything about Elspeth's situation. The righteous Nakatel couldn't bear leaving her friend to pursue her self-destructive behavior without doing anything about it. So he decided to put on hold his mission and track her down on the plane of Theris, a world governed by the gods of Nyx where worthy heroes face dreadful monsters and epic adventures take place. This was not the first time on the plane for Ajani. During his advisory journeys to help fellow Leonin communities across various planes, he had already visited Theros, and he was also well acquainted with the cat warrior Brimus, who, in the meantime, had risen to become king. Huddled around a campfire, Ajani learned from his old friend that the plane was in a difficult situation of power struggle in which Elspeth had played an important part and had also been the victim of many injustices. As a favor to his old friend, King Bremus sent a squad of his best truckers to find the Bond Planeswalker and after a brief search, Ajani and Elspeth were reunited at Thetmus. Golmain could clearly see that her trials had badly hurt her, but no matter how hard he tried, he could not get Tyrell to speak of what happened. Something in her was clearly broken, but nonetheless, the knight stood proud and resolute. I will make things right. That's all she said, and Ajani agreed to stand by her side. To make things right, Elspeth claimed they would have to journey through the mysterious temple of Crufix on the outermost edge of Theris. Only there could she exact her revenge or obtain her redemption. This was no easy task, though. There wasn't any map that one could follow to get to Crufix, and although many beggars and old merchants couldn't wait to sell their own true and unique map to the mystical place, none of them could ever prove truly that their information were of any value. There was only one way to reach such an isolated and recondite place. The planeswalkers had to call upon the legendary sunken ship known as the Monsoon. After a series of adventures, complications, betrayals and sheer luck, they managed to reach the outermost edges of the world and the Temple of Crufix. There, the god Crufix himself granted them safe passage through the gateway of Nyctus towards the Shrine of Nyx, the night sky of Theris and home to all its gods. Upon reaching the shrine, the duo was attacked by the satire planeswalker and god of revels, Xenagos, who had been Elspeth's target all along. The three fought a fierce battle until Halspeth finally managed to strike down her opponent, perforating his chest with her legendary weapon, Godsend. After the lifeless corpse of Xenagos fell to Theros, Nylea, the goddess of Hunt, warned the two beaten up planeswalker to hurry away from Theros as Erebus, the god of death, and Iliad, the god of sun, were after them. Ajani and Elspeth listened to Nylea's warning, but they were still too weak because of the recent battle and couldn't leave the plane fast enough. The mighty Heliod arrived and there was nothing that the two heroes could do. Heliod easily got rid of the Naya Nakatel and, using her own weapon as ultimate sign of superiority, he struck Elspeth to death. Then he cast the two out of Nyx and back to Theris's mainland. Ajani woke up a couple of days later in Tethmus, where Bremus's healers were taking care of him. 
For weeks then, he incessantly mourned his friend until one day he decided that Heliod had to pay for what he had done. However, killing the god was out of the question. Nyx was even more out of reach now and the sun god was way too powerful to be faced alone. There was something else that the albino planeswalker could do though. Like every god, Heliod fed on devotion and worship. Ajani decided to take that away from him. He traveled to Heliod's temple at Melitus and started to talk about Heliod's cold-blooded murder of Elspeth. Then the Nakatl went back to King Grimace and asked his old friend to spread the word also amongst his subject. With that, Ajani earned his place within the Leonin ranks of Theris and he now constantly wears Elspeth's cloak to honor his friend's memory. Sometime after this, Ajani left Theras sure that his words had taken roots among the population. He planeswalked to the plain of Kamigawa to inform his old friend and companion Tamiyo of Elspeth's death. Ajani and Tamiyo had met during one of his wanderings across the multiverse and the Kamigawa planeswalker had formed a small restricted story circle to exchange tales about the multiverse. Both Ajani Goldmain and Elspeth Tyrell had been members of this group. Ajani then decided to stay a little while with Tamiyo to mourn Elspeth's fate with her, and during his stay, he also learned of the crimes that had been committed by the Esperate planeswalker Tezzeret at the Infinite Consortium. If you wish to know more about this, I've made a video entirely dedicated to Tezzeret that you can find in the top right corner of your screen or in the description below this video. Make sure to check it out. On the same occasion, Ajani remembered that his late friend Helspeth had informed him to have recently seen Tezzeret alive and well on the plane of Neophyrexia, in cahoots with the five Neophyrexian Praetors on the plane. Soon enough, Ajani resolved to pick up his self-assigned role of Lawbringer once more. He prepared to track Tezzeret down and left Kamigawa to bring him to justice. After a month-long research across multiple planes, Ajani learned that the Metal Mage had assumed one of the highest positions within the Consulate Dictatorship on the plane of Kaladesh. Ajani reached the plane and immediately made contact with the operatives of the Resistance in Girapur, the capital city of the plane. The Leonin then learned that Pia Nalar, mother of the renowned Pyromancer Chandra Nalar and leader of the Resistance, had been taken into custody by order of Tezzeret himself. Later, the Nyan Planeswalker also contributed to the liberation of several captive members of the Resistance as well as of the Green and Red Planeswalkers Nissa Ravain and Chandra Nalar from a consulate jail. Ajani also stood by the Gatewatch to back Chandra during her confrontation with Tezzeret at the Inverter's Fair and took great care of the young Pyromancer and her injuries after she had been critically wounded in her duel with Consulate Executive Baral when the Great Ether Revolts erupted. Once the Renegades had secured their victory in the revolt and brought forth sweeping changes to the consulate, Ajani found it an honor to be welcomed among the ranks of the Gatewatch. In a natural extension of his previous role, he joined the other planeswalkers of the group to fight off Bolas and other threats to the whole multiverse. The Leonin took his oath and solemnly swore he'd do anything in his power to protect the innocent from ruthless tyrants and help all living beings in finding their place in the world. Although he now stood among them, Ajani firmly objected to the Gatewatch plans to immediately confront Nicol Bolas on the plane of Amonkhet. He pleaded with them to wait a little longer to gather more allies and come up with a real plan before confronting such a powerful and threatening enemy. The consequences of failure and possible collateral damage of their recklessness would have been too awful to even put into words. Bolas was weak but unpredictable. The Elder Dragon could have a million cards left to play and it made no sense to risk everything out of hubris. The rest of the Gatewatch, however, thought differently. They were determined to follow Bolas's lead on Amonkhet at once to strike him while he was still weak enough. Seeing that they were beyond convincing, Ajani asked them at least to regroup in Dominaria afterwards to report about their visit to Amonkhet. While waiting for them, Ajani also recruited Joyra and a Weatherlight crew to aid the Gatewatch in their mission. The Weatherlight Skyship was a massive vehicle capable of moving across planes and it had been designed by the legendary Teresian artificer Urza himself. When word of the Gatewatch return spread across Dominaria, Ajani was extremely worried and disappointed to find out that only Gideon Jura and Liliana Vess had actually returned. 
things that Amon Ket hadn't gone as expected, and although the Leonin planeswalker tried to reach out to his two companions to gather more details about what had happened, he learned that they were unavailable due to their implication in the quest against the demon Belzenlock. If you wish to know more about this, check out my Liliana Vest Complete History video where there's a whole section dedicated entirely to this. You can find it in the description below this video or, as always, in the top right corner of your screen right now. Okay, so let's go back to Ajani. At this point, one thing was clear for him. The great enemy was about to return, stronger and more determined to conquer the multiverse than ever before. There was no time to lose. If they were to cross path with him, they would have needed all the help that they could find. So the Nakato promptly left Dominari again to recruit even more planeswalkers to join them in their final battle against the Elder Dragon. In the build-up of the War of the Sparks, Ajani traveled with the Gatewatch to Ravnica for the final confrontation with Nicol Bolas and immediately became trapped due to Bolas' use of the legendary Mortal Sun. If you're not aware of this, the War of the Sparks was an epic war fought on Ravnica that saw the undead forces of Nicol Bolas, led by the enslaved necromancer and former Gatewatch member Liliana Vess, fighting against a cross-planar resistance led by the Ravnican and Gatewatch forces together. If you wish to know more about the dynamics of the conflicts and the legendary artifact known as the Immortal Sun, check out my Rushka Complete History video where you'll find a detailed section about it. During the War of the Sparks, Ajani's contribution was invaluable. He bolstered the anti-Bolas forces by creating other copies of his Leonin allies from Naya and Theras, and he rallied the trapped planeswalkers against Bolas himself, inspiring courage in them and constantly boosting their morale. His healing and protective skills then proved extremely useful in keeping many fellow soldiers and planeswalkers alive through the conflict. Moreover, together with Watli, Yanggu and Yanleng, Ajani volunteered to help protect and rescue the civilians caught up in the fight. Aided by the Golgari Swarm Guild and their leader Rashka, they were able to evacuate many people through the underway tunnels beneath the city, keeping them safe from the fury of the Dread Horde. Thanks to Liliana's betrayal and Gideon's sacrifice, the Gatewatch eventually ended up defeating Bolas and winning the War of the Sparks on Ravnica, disbanding Bolas's forces and killing the fierce Dragon Plains Walker. Ajani survived the battle and was also present during the plain white celebration that followed. Later, he also took part in the memorial service held in Gideon's honor on the plain of Theras. A few days after bidding farewell to his old friend, Ajani traveled to the Humoran state of Femareth on Dominaria. There, he met with the Golem planeswalker Karn and the assembled Gatewatch to come up with a plan to confront the rising threat of the new Phyrexian expansion. On that same occasion, the Leonin also reunited against all odds with his beloved friend Hellspit, whom he found alive and well. The Errant Knight explained that Theros was different from every other plane in the multiverse in the sense that there, death was not final, rather the beginning of a new journey. By thriving in the underworld of Theros, she had eventually managed to win the god of death Erebos' eternal gratitude and the permission to return to the world of the living. Ajani was exalted with joy, but once again there was no time to celebrate. Elspeth's survival could have been the missing piece that would grant the Gatewatch the upper hand against the dark forces of Phyrexia. Ajani promptly told his friend that, through his studies, he had discovered that her own plane had somehow survived the Phyrexian invasion in the past. At his request then, Elspeth left towards the metropolis of New Capena, capital city of her home plane Capena, to learn what secrets lied behind its survival from the Phyrexian Aurors. While awaiting new information from Elspeth, news about Karn's supposed abduction by the Phyrexian agents reached the Gatewatch in Thamareth. 
Ajani was immediately sent by Joira to rescue the Silver Golem from the caves of Koilos, located within the desert region of Teresiare in Dominaria. The Golgothian Silex was a massively destructive weapon that had been previously used by Orza to destroy the Phyrexian forces during the first Phyrexian invasion and to put an end to the legendary Great War with his brother Mishra, known as the Brothers War. The energy that had been released in that occasion was so strong that it had irreversibly altered Dominaria's climate system, causing a 2000 years long ice age and the downfall of most of Dominaria's major civilizations at the time. Now, Karn planned to use that same power to wipe out the plane of Neophyrexia and all of its twisted inhabitants with it. Soon after having rejoined Karn, Ajani was informed about Tamiya's completion by the Yumuran planeswalker Teferi. Completion is the Phyrexian state of maturity and perfection, and it symbolizes the process of transformation of a living thing into a Phyrexian creature. After the process, the creature is considered to be completed as it retains nothing from its previous state and is now completely subjugated to the greater will of Phyrexia. Simultaneously, Ajani also found out that many of the Knights of New Banalia, the capital city of the human realm of Banalia and Dominaria, were undercover Phyrexian sleeper agents. He was outraged and livid. He resolved he couldn't just sit back on this, so he split from Karn to pursue them. During the fourth day of his chase, however, he was ambushed by a full squad of Phyrexian agents in his sleep. Ajani fought proudly and giving everything he had in him, but in the end, his enemies were simply too many and he was overwhelmed. Once defeated, Ajani was abducted and brought to the ever-burning furnaces of New Phyrexia, and there, he was remade into one of them. It is time for Dominaria to finally become whole. I will stitch perfection into the flesh of this land. It is unknown for how long they tortured him, but amidst the endless screams and inane bubble, a new, evil and twisted form of what Ajani once was came to life. Then the Battle of the Manoreg took place. The Battle of the Manoreg was the final confrontation of the second Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria operated by the forces of New Phyrexia. The battle was fought between the re-established coalition of unified Dominarian forces who had previously stood against the first Phyrexian invasion and the new Phyrexian troops led by the Black Praetor Shieldred, the Whispering One. There, Ajani unexpectedly revealed his completion by killing the human mage planeswalker, an important asset of the coalition, Jaya Ballard. He then destroyed the Golgothian Silex, securing the survival of New Phyrexia and helped the other sleeper agents in abducting Karn. While the immense force of will wielded by the Nyan Planeswalker initially allowed him to resist his Leaper agent's reprogramming, his values quickly came to align with those of Phyrexia. Ajani felt as if he had finally been welcomed into a new pride that truly respected and valued him, a longing he had fostered since his very youth. His inherent beliefs and goals have now been twisted to align with those of his new masters, now that Phyrexia has opened his eyes to the danger that differences can cause. Teamwork, he has now come to realize, is about aligning multiple perspectives into a single, unified point of view. Only by eradicating every form of diversity can everyone be joyfully together as part of a single, unstoppable Phyrexian pride. Now, a renewed, stronger, 
faster and that Lirajani longs to welcome his former friends into his new family, making them too feel the mechanical embrace of Phyrexian completion. Hey you guys, if you made it this far, thank you so much for tuning in for this Planeswalkers 101 episode featuring the mighty cat warrior Ajani Goldmane. Remember that if you wish to support the channel and what I do, the best way to do so is to hit that subscribe button now, share it with your friends, leave a thumbs up, and if you still have some energy after all of this, I'd really appreciate to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. Once again, thank you all so much for the good comments and the love that you're showing me. I'm sure you already know that by now, but if you don't, my name is Octopus, and I will see you in the next one.